just appreciate the opportunity to be speaking to you. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is addressing nasal obstruction during secondary rhinoplasty surgery. When we speak of secondary rhinoplasty surgery, we're speaking about the revision rhinoplasty patient. Uh, associations, and I am a speaker and a grant recipient for Stryker. Uh, Stryker is a company that, um, that produces medical supplies and instruments. I, not going to discuss any of these issues. It's unrelated to this presentation, but I want to give you full disclosure that I, that I do have a relationship with them. Uh, in regards to uh, the overview, we're going to speak about nasal support mechanisms. We're going to speak about airflow physics and the basis for nasal valve preservation. Uh, I'll talk to you about some aesthetic maneuvers that you can utilize in your practice and also some research and how we combine some of these techniques in treating patients with uh, nasal valve obstruction and aesthetic rhinoplasty. Very particular to this topic is the preservation of the keystone, which is an area where the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid uh, articulates with the nasal bone and the upper lateral cartilage. And this area can settle if there is over resection of this area. In addition, there's the caudal septum. So the caudal aspect of the septal cartilage is also an area of concern because uh, under resection can lead to polybeak formation. Over resection can lead to saddling as well as uh, nasal obstruction uh, that can uh, present in the patient's uh, evaluation, which may be from this caudal septal deviation. When we look at the valve, we have to consider that the External valve is really can be diagnosed quite easily by looking at the collimella, the nasal sill, and the lateral nasal wall. And so any interaction in this area uh, from these structures uh, either being deficient or collapsing, or if you have a caudal deviation can cause an external valve collapse. And so when we think about the valve, we really think about Bernoulli's equation and we think about a attenuation of area from an obstruction, which will lead to a drop in pressure and an increase in velocity. This increase in velocity leads to turbulent, turbulent airflow, and the patient senses this as an airflow obstruction. If one was to take acoustic rhinometry and use this for an evaluation of the overall area and look at airflow dynamics, and you begin from the anterior aspect of the nose to the posterior aspect of the nose, we can see that there are two attenuations. One is the valve itself, and the second attenuation is the inferior turbinate. Now, you can decongest the patient, and by decongesting the patient with, with a nasal steroid, for example, or oxymetazoline, you can improve the airflow of the soft tissue, as you can see here in the latter aspect, of the airflow chart, but you will never be able to improve the valve dynamics, the attenuation of area from an internal or external valve. And so medications alone are not sufficient to improve airflow dynamics when it comes to variable resistance. The two areas of variable resistance are again the valve, which could be internal or external, and the inferior turbinate. Now diving a little bit Further into what the internal valve is, it is, the, um, it is defined as a point of maximal resistance affected by several structures. One, it's an area, so it's a cross-sectional area. Two, it's affected by the inferior turbinate laterally, the septum medially, and the upper lateral cartilage um, also laterally. And so we call this angle between the upper lateral cartilage and the septum as an angle which defines the internal valve. The angle itself should be about 20 degrees. However, it is a cross-sectional area when describing the point of maximal resistance. And so as we look at what area restrictions give you, limitations in nasal airflow dynamics translate into several things. High velocity flow that we spoke about earlier with Bernoulli's principle, creating a negative pressure. This negative pressure is going to be highest at the internal valve and the external valve. And so when we look at valve dynamics, the nasal valve, which could be external or internal in nature, will cause a cross-sectional area change, which limits inspiration.
So think about it more of it as an area, not just an angle. Often we look at the internal valve and we look at the angle and we look at what's affecting the angle, but it's the entire area which is affected. A common procedure that can be entertained is a caudal maneuver. It's just this tract and lateral ala. What we do specifically is we use the modified caudal in clinical examination. And let me show you a video of what a modified caudal actually looks like. So if you ask most otolaryngologists, which evaluate deviated septums, <clears throat> what is the most common area of obstruction, 63, per 63 patients out of 100 it would, would, would be identified as having a deviated septum and a turbinate reduction, which would be something that would be entertained in surgery. However, when a positive caudal maneuver is used as a guide, 60% of these patients out of 100 will find themselves with nasal valve collapse. And so the clinician can judge that there is a nasal valve problem. And if the nasal valve is addressed, then you'll see improvement in these patients. And the improvement at one year with a positive caudal test is about 63%. With a negative caudal test, which is septoplasty and turbinate reduction, it's 83%. So how do, you, how do we perform a modified caudal? Uh, Dr. Toriumi is, um, I have a recorded video from him with permission to show this video of how he uses the modified caudal. Now we're gonna maneuver. examine Candace. First of all, by history, uh, when she breathes in, she has difficulty breathing through the, in both nostrils. And so what we typically do is we'll put her head back here and I'll watch her breathe. And what you see here very clearly, breathe in again, is you see this whole sidewall of her nose move medially. And what that means is there's weakness in the lateral wall, it's collapsing into her airway and blocking it. So if I take this cerumen loop and just gently place it here to, for support, breathe in now. Candace, does that help your breathing? Yeah. So what we're doing is using this instrument to basically simulate support applied to that area. Now, one of the problems we have with exam is we all take a nasal speculum, we place it in the nose, and I'm looking at the septum and it's straight. And then I don't understand why this patient has difficulty breathing, but what I'm actually doing here is I'm supporting the problem. I'm looking right past the problem. The problem is right here in the sidewall of her nose. Breathe in again. And that's what we're seeing here, it's this collapse. Great, and so when we look at the treating the lateral wall, there are several things we have to consider. One is that 95% nasal obstructions today in the world are usually treated with septoplasty and turbinate reduction. However, when a patient has lateral wall insufficiency, as you can see here on an endoscopic view, and continues to collapse, if the lateral wall is not addressed, then the patient will continue to have obstruction. So this is our first poll question. What clinical exam feature denotes lateral wall insufficiency? You can go ahead and vote uh, now. Great, we'll end the poll. <clears throat> so we'll share the results. So the correct answer is modified caudal maneuver. That is the examination that we demonstrated in the video showing that support of the lateral wall is a clinical exam feature that will denote lateral wall insufficiency. Great, so let's go on. So there are lots of lateral wall techniques that we can uh, utilize. And current lateral wall techniques may be uh, surgical in nature, and there's others that are non-surgical in nature. So the surgical techniques uh, that uh, are very common and have been utilized uh, in the past uh, have been like ehlers batten grafting. So this is a very typical uh, technique which has been used for many years. Uh, there's other techniques, uh, specifically 
lateral struck grafting and um, a bone anchor suture technique and a turning flap, which I will discuss. However, the non-surgical solution, uh, Breathe Right Strip, is very popular around the world and 250 million Breathe Right Strips are sold each year. And so many patients will tell you that they use a Breathe Right Strip. In essence, they're letting you know that they have lateral wall insufficiency. Spreader grafting is a specific technique that we utilize to improve the internal valve area. It helps prevent middle wall collapse and provides some symmetry. A spreader graft can be utilized uh, after your osteotomies to improve the internal valve as shown here. And spreader grafts, although it denotes spreading the nasal dorsum, does not need to be anesthetic. It doesn't significantly improve the nasal width unless you want it to, and it's determined by the surgeon whether you're using a septum, septal cartilage graft for a spreader graft or a rib graft or a regular cartilage. Uh, the size and shape are all determined by the anatomy of the patient and what's needed in the surgical operation. This is a patient of mine that came in to see me with a large nasal hump, and she also had a deviated nose. You can see that there's a, a small S-shaped deformity, and there's and the nose is slightly to the left of the patient. She does have narrow asymmetric nostrils. And so what we performed was a dorsal hump resection, and then we place, I placed spreader graft. I also performed... Uh, cephalic trim and dome spanning sutures in a collinose struck graft. This is, her, this is the patient 12 months post-operatively, before and after. She also, she's a little red in the face because we use Sculptra, which is a polylactic acid filler, uh, but you can see that the nose is now midline and more symmetric than it was before. And before, this was our, our projected anticipated surgical results for hump resection and this was her post-operative result one year after surgery. And so we were able to achieve deprojection of the nose as well as dorsal uh, deprojection, but we were able to sustain the results with spreader grafts. This is her three-quarter view, and this is her base view. And you can see on the base view that we have a very symmetric uh, triangular base now. Spreader grafts can also be used to provide symmetry. And so in patients that are asymmetric like this, much more significant C-shaped deformity, we can actually utilize a double spreader graft. So in this patient I'm about to show you, we use a double spreader graft on the left side um, to, to uh, fix that problem. And here she is uh, utilizing a double spreader graft, as you can see here. And we did a, a single spreader graft on the other side, and then we did some dome spanning sutures, uh, a septal extension graft, and it's a cephalic resection. And this is her before, and this is her after. And this is her before surgery. After surgery, and we can see that the nose is a bit more symmetric and the C-shaped deformity is much improved and the collapsed middle vault is improved by utilizing a double spreader graft. So the next poll question. Spreader graphs are placed to correct which of the following except. So we'll go ahead and start the poll. So, uh, Jose, until the, uh, we have more responses from the participants for the poll, uh, we have a question here from uh, Carlos Lopez uh, from uh, Colombia. Yes. Uh, and uh, actually he was our speaker in the previous uh, study club, and we are very happy to, uh, to see him uh, joining us uh, today. Great. And he's Thank asking you, a very interesting question. Uh, which maneuvers do you employ when you ac accidentally disarticulate the keystone junction uh, without enough cephalic cartilage uh, to, to reposition the septum uh, with sutures? Great, that's, that's a super question. So the keystone, as, as you know, uh, is, uh, is an area that we began the lecture saying we have to be very careful of because this articulation can lead to significant saddling and a fracture along the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid may be a, may be a significant problem. 
Um, and so in my hands, if it usually, if it occurs, I've seen it rarely, uh, it's usually with a Joseph technique. So, so a hump resection with a typical Joseph rhinoplasty technique, whereby an end block resection of the dorsal cartilage and bone was taken. And so uh, when that occurs, you have a couple of choices. One is transnasal wiring or transnasal sutures. And so a, uh, a 14 gauge or 16 gauge cannula can be placed external to the skin through the nasal bones at the area of the keystone and then sutures pass transnasally, almost very similar to what you would do in a nasal orbital ethmoid fracture, except instead of stabilizing the lacrimal crest, you're actually stabilizing the, the keystone itself, the collapse, um, perpendicular pit of ethmoid and, and um, as it corresponds to the nasal pyramid. So that particular case is, is very tricky. So transnasal wiring or transnasal sutures, uh, you can use transnasal sutures uh, with, um, with a large uh, 2.0 PDS, and then you're gonna have to take it out uh, after a week or two. Now you may also employ some rooter splints, silastic splints along the nasal pyramid so that you don't depress the skin too much. Uh, another uh, technique is uh, which may be simpler if it's not too big of a saddle is placing spreader grafts extending in the area of collapse and then uh, also utilizing uh, a 18 gauge needle to make a perforation in the nasal bone which will go through the nasal bone with a 2 OPDS or 3 OPDS suture through the spreader graft through the keystone the perpendicular plate of ethmoid which now needs to be elevated right as part of the septum and then through the opposite spreader graft, through the opposite nasal pyramid, and you can actually tie that intranasally. So a significant collapse uh, will require a transnasal suturing. A minor collapse, it can be performed intranasally. And then third technique is, if it was an end block resection utilizing a Rubin osteotome, then you can take that end block reception, that cap of bone, and you could trim down the kappa bone and you could replace it on the dorsum. And that kappa bone, once it's trimmed, will conform itself nicely to the defect. So those are three different techniques that, that I would employ in that situation. Hopefully that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, thank you. It was very, a very clear answer. Thank you. Thank so. you, Carlos, for the question. So the answer is caudal septal deviation. And the reason why I said that, say this is although you can use extended spreader grafts to assist in improving the caudal septal deviation, it usually requires additional grafting of the caudal septum utilizing a septal extension graft or a uh, anterior septal reconstruction or a modified extracorporeal septoplasty to address the most deviated caudal septums. So sometimes a spreader graft can be used for this, but not uniformly, but uniformly asymmetry of the middle vault, internal valve collapse, and internal and inverted V deformity spreader grafts are used for these specific uh, indications. So a little bit trickier question. Uh, it's not always uniformly used for caudal septal deviation though. And I'll show you some research around that. All right, so the external valve. The external valve is often seen in patients in clinic. They'll come in, they'll say, doc, when I breathe in, I collapse. I actually have some external valve collapse, so I understand. Uh, and there's lots of treatment options. Although not exhaustive, ailer batten grafting can be used, lateral nasal wall suspension suturing, lateral curl steel or, and lateral curl strut grafts, uh, ailer turn in flaps and can also be utilized. This, this is a picture of a residual rhinoplasty patient that I performed with Dr. Most back when I was a fellow with him. This is due to over resection or, a, or sometimes due to a vertical dome division with over resection with asymmetry. And so a ailer batten graft is the type of graft that can replace the lateral nasal wall. And so in this format, I don't use a small button graft like described by Dr. Park. I actually utilize a large graft which over extends into the piriform aperture because I want a cantilever effect on the lateral nasal wall. So in this scenario, we are using the batten graft to improve the stability of the lateral nasal wall at the external valve and the intervalve area. The intervalve area is that area between the internal valve and the external valve. We can also utilize to stabilize 
an overly, overly resected lateral crura like I showed you in the last case example. So this is a patient who received batten grafts with me and she's nine months post-operatively. And you can see here that, all, that she, although she has a little bit of effacement of the ala crease, you, can't see the, you cannot see the batten grafts. This is her base view and you can see how we can open up the aperture of the external valve utilizing these batten grafts. This is a patient that presented to me uh, for revision rhinoplasty and she had uh, a secondary complication from the batten graft. She is, um, comes in and this is what you see. She's already had a rhinoplasty with batten grafts and you can see these, the super ailer depression. To me, when you see super ailer depression as you see here, automatically I know that there's a lateral crural problem. When she breathes in, she's still collapsing. And so in this case, we utilized a lateral nasal suspension technique, which was also described by Dr. Mose and Dr. Roof, the external and intervalve area. And it doesn't give you significant widening of the nasal base. And so here we are. So I show you the dissection. A quick anchor is placed on the bone itself, and then the lateral nasal wall is suspended with a 4-0 PDS suture. Now when this is performed, you can get some elevation of the lateral crura. And so this is our patient with a um, bilateral uh, batten grafts. She's six months post-op. This is her after the lateral suspension, nasal wall suspension. And you can see here we were able to rotate the nose a little bit, give her some tip symmetry, but you see effacement of that lateral wall. And then a maximal inspiration, you see an opening of the aperture of the nose. And so it's a nice technique to utilize. That's the nasal valve. Let's talk about some suture techniques and, and uh, ailer modifications. So this is a patient with a bulbous tip. The patient um, uh, uh, wanted a smaller nose. We performed cephalic resection. And it's important when we perform cephalic resection that's conservative. We want to at least preserve about eight millimeters of the lateral crua. Some literature says six millimeters, but once you get to six millimeters, you begin to get lateral nasal wall insufficiency. So here's a cephalic trim, very basic technique. And uh, I like this technique, which is, um, allows us for cranial, um, cranialization or cranial orientation of lateral crura. And it's important when this technique is performed that this is an article by Dr. Toriumi that we try to achieve lateralization of the lower lateral cartilage and, and make sure that it's not cephalic. You see here under 30 degrees, it's cephalic in nature and a good uh, suture technique will give us lateralization. There's another article by Dr. Neves um, in, out of Portugal showing a 15 to 45 degree divergence uh, in the angulation. And again, describing this lateral control uh, suture technique that can be utilized for this cranial approach, cephalic orientation of the lower lateral cartilage. This is our patient. This is after cephalic trim and uh, cranialization suturing of the lateral crew. This is another technique that I also want to present to you. It, it is, I'm trying to describe this technique of preservation of the lateral crew. Why is this important? Because if you don't preserve the lateral crew, you're going to end up in a revision rhinoplasty because of lateral nasal wall insufficiency. This patient had dorsal hump asymmetry. We published this paper in 2009. Uh, we use, utilize an ailer turn and flap in order to improve intact ailer cartilages. Um, and this is not a case for revision rhinoplasty with cephalic uh, resection. This is a case of an intact ailer cartilage technique to preserve the structural integrity of the nasal tip. Here's the technique where we perform cephalic resection, but then we utilize the cephalic aspect, the cephalic resection of the lower lateral cartilage, we do a turn-in flap. It is a cephalic turn-in flap. You could either flip it on itself or slide it underneath the vestibular skin. So this is an ailer turn-in flap. Here's her post-operative result. And we improve the lateral nasal wall integrity. Now, what about the patient that's a revision patient now? So we're going to a much more complicated patient. We talked about preserving the lateral crew. Now we're going to go to a patient that's already been resected. A patient with lateral crew resection, we're going to utilize a lateral crew struck graft. This is a uh, technique described by Dr. Toriumi in 1999. It addresses both intervalve and external valve collapse. It supports an overly resected lateral crew. 
It can reshape a convex lid or crua, and it's useful in most revision cases. So this is a patient of mine. She had external valve collapse. You can see here that she's collapsing completely. We perform this maneuver in order to open up that aperture and give her symmetry. So you can see here before she was tilted, now she has better symmetry on the nasal base. How do we do perform this technique? We utilize septal cartilage or rib cartilage, and we can place the lateral crow through the cephalic approach, we can all, or, or a caudal approach. Currently we're showing it being placed through a cephalic approach. And this is a patient Dr. Torumi described in 2006 resection of the, of the lateral crua, and then the lateral crua struct graft being placed um, as a underlay support to correct uh, convexity. You can see here in this paper that the lateral crua was actually very short in nature. This is one of my patients with a hanging collimella and over resection. You can see here that on this picture that there's, um, that there's over resection from previous rhinoplasty, there's buckling and knuckling of the lateral crua. So upon dissection, we perform uh, spreader grafts, lateral crua struck grafts, dome spanning sutures, and tongue and groove. In order to improve the result, you can see here that this knuckle here was due to over resection of the lower lateral cartilage. These lower car lateral cartilages measured four millimeters. Again, less than six millimeters is not sufficient. I use rib graft with a lateral crow struck graft in order to stabilize this lateral crua. And you can see here immediately post-op, we're able to reduce this knuckling and achieve better symmetry. So lateral crow struck grafts, I'll show you a video of how to place the issue them. Is the patient has valve collapse in this orientation. This is more 25, 30 degrees off midline, so we're going to put it more accentuated. Again, 25, 30 degrees off midline. We want it greater than 30, 30 degrees off midline. So we're going to completely dissect the lateral crua. Through a caudal approach, release the vestibular skin. The lateral crua is then, after it's released, it's actually overlaid and delivered over the external nose. And then after this is done, we're gonna use rib graft, typically rib graft, or if you have long enough septo cartilage that remains, now these are revision cases typically, so you may not have septo cartilage, but you need a nice straight piece of cartilage. And the graft, the lateral short graft, is gonna extend beyond the length of the lower lateral cartilage. And we will suspend it like so. Same thing on the other side, the issue. So after we perform this, we're going to use uh, a septal center graft made out of rib to then stabilize the medial aspect, the septal aspect of the nasal tip. So you can see how extensive this rib graft is. And because we want to overlap the piriform aperture for patients with lateral wall insufficiency. Now patients that don't have lateral insufficiency, you don't need to make the lateral cross stroke graft this long, but we want to combine it with with another graph for tip support. So here's the end result um, on the table. And so the combination of these techniques, lateral nasal wall suspension, lateral cross struck grafts, are utilized in revision surgery in order to improve the lateral wall sufficiency as well as to improve patients with intervalve and external valve collapse. It can be used for overly resected lateral crua, it reshapes convex lateral crua. It's very useful in revision cases. So this is a patient that presents to me. She had a rhinoplasty five years prior. She had difficulty breathing. And she wants improvement in her nasal tip. So how would you address the external and internal valve in this case? How would you address the, the nasal tip? She has really a little uni tip. How about the infratip lobule, the hanging infratip lobule? So here's a patient. She has a little saddling, hanging infratip lobule. She has a really unitip. Her, she can't breathe when she breathes in. She really collapses that external aperture of her, of her external valve. And so in this case, I perform a combination of techniques. The lateral nasal wall suspension, we also call that the bone anchor suture technique I showed you, that Dr. Most developed, the lateral stroke crux graft, strut grafts that Dr. Toriumi spoke about, spreader grafts, um, which, which have, been, um, uh, have been described over many years 
uh, onlay grafts, dome spanning suture, tongue and groove, and medial crew fixation sutures. This is my patient before and after. In a sense, what we did for her is we gave her a bigger nose. We improved the internal valve, we improved the external valve. Instead of a uni tip, now she has two tip defining points. She has narrowing of the external valve here. She has a much more open aperture of the external valve. And that's the goal of the surgery. Here's a saddling she presented. She had a long nose with a hanging infratip lobule. We were able to shorten that and give her a more appropriate nose for her face that she can function with. So it's both aesthetic and uh, cosmetic in nature. Poll question. Lateral curl struck grafts are utilized in the following except So lateral curl struck grafts really have quite a bit of utility in most revision cases. But where you have over resection of the nasal dorsum, like a saddle nose deformity, we'll go ahead and end the poll. A lateral curl struck graft by itself will not help a saddle nose deformity. There are other techniques like spreader grafting and overlay grafts that can help a saddle nose deformity. By and large, everyone got that right. Let's move on forward. Now that we described some of these aesthetic maneuvers, let's speak about some research. Uh, and so, present to you a few papers that are very interesting. We all understand that we need support. And although some patients present with bifidity and broad nasal tips, and you want to perform cephalic trim and narrowing of the nasal base, uh, you have to still consider that if you don't have structural support, you can end up with uh, nasal valve collapse. This is a paper that I performed and we utilize a human anatomic model. We measured the amount of force Newtons that was deployed on the, na on the nose itself preoperatively. And then after elevation of the skin soft tissue envelope and a septoplasty, after just dome sutures, after collimellar strut, and then after cauter extension graft or septal extension graft. As you can see here, the amount of force newton support that you can get from a cauter extension graft by far is higher, more supportive in, in tip compression scenarios than these other techniques. As a matter of fact, there was no statistically significant difference on nasal recoil with septoplasty, with dome sutures, or with collimellar struts. And so when I think about the study and I compare it, the septal extension graft, a caudal extension graft, can deploy an extensive amount of support applied using force newtons as a measure over an amount of deflective compression, where the other techniques really, they were about the same um, as far as tip recoil and nasal tip support. The maximal depth of decompression in the study was 2.5 millimeters. So what does this tell me? It goes to show me that when I look at papers like what Dr. Torumi described, placing a septal extension graft um, on its end with spreader grafts, um, or if you do an anti-side septal extension graft, uh, the support that you get with a septal extension graft is significantly stronger than what you would get with a spreader graft, with a um, columnar struck graft or a dome suturing. This is why we see the tip drop sometimes, which is dome suturing or, or columnar struck grafting. The other thing that's what's nice about septal extension graft is you can deploy lateral curl tensioning to a septal extension graft, which will give you further support of the lateral nasal wall. And so combining traditional lateral curl steel or lateral curl tensioning maneuvers can significantly improve lateral wall stability. So let's talk about these techniques. This is a rib graft being fashioned as a septal extension graft. This is a patient with a totic tip and a slight dorsal hump, micro hump. This is immediately post-operatively after septal extension graft and lateral curl tensioning. Let me show you this patient's case. 
we incorporated um, a caudal uh, dissection of the septum here. We performed cephalic trim of the lower lateral cartilages, as you can see here. After this is performed, we release the medial crura on both sides, and this medial crura is released from the vestibular skin because we're going to later on uh, put a tongue and groove suture in there. I will perform my cephalic, uh, excuse me, my, my um, dome spanning sutures, as you can see here, and these are dome spanning sutures being deployed to reorient the lateral crura. And for time's sake, I, I don't operate this fast. <laughs> We, uh, we did this uh, in order to incorporate the operation for uh, presentation purposes. So then after this is performed, you can see here that you get very good tip elevation. Now, according to my study, dome spanning sutures by itself are not supportive enough. Um, we then fixate these dome spanning sutures either to the native caudal septum or to a caudal extension graft. And you can see here how this is much more supportive when fixated to, a, to this caudal extension graft that was previously placed. So this is how I perform my lateral curl tensioning technique to a either caudal septum or to a septal extension graft, caudal extension graft. So here again is the, is the operation. Let me move forward. Here is what you didn't see was the previous placement of a septal extension graft. Uh, in, another, in another patient, also made out of rib, and the dome spanning suture being formed and then supported with, lat with these lateral curl tensioning sutures uh, that have been popularized by Dr. Davis, Dr. Wong, and others. This is a patient before and after, after dorsal hump resection, spreader graft for asymmetry, osteotomies, septal extension graft, and lateral curl tensioning suture technique. And this is our post-operative outcome at six months. We had a satisfactory result. Show you another case now, another complex case. This is a revision case, but it's a revision case different than what you might consider. It's a revision case uh, of a patient with airway obstruction and severe obstructive sleep apnea, a patient that was trach dependent, uh, who underwent also had a vocal cord paralysis. We ended up doing um, supraglottoplasty on in order to improve the patient's airway, a genioglossal advancement to advance the, the jaw, and uh, the patient had previous U triple P. When the patient presented to me, I noted that the patient had pre-maxillary deficiency and a saddle nose deformity, and this was his native nose. And so I did speak to the patient about rhinoplasty, but first we needed to decannulate him, uh, so I performed um, a Lafort 1 osteotomy bilateral sagittal split. Uh, the nose itself, let's dive into this a little bit further, maxillary hypoplasia will affect the overall projection of the nose. If there's no base support, then you're going to get the zone one internal valve collapse because the entire nose is going to saddle into the maxilla and of course present with obstruction. And so the bony anatomy is very important I perform a Lefort 1 advancement of 10 millimeters with down fracture, and this afforded me advancement of the maxillary crest here. I also perform a bilateral sagittal split osteotomy and genoglossal advancement. The patient with severe uh, maxillary hypoplasia first underwent orthognathic surgery, and then I performed rhinoplasty with costal cartilage grafting afterwards. This is the patient's maxilla, which is very flat and deficient. Uh, perform a 10 millimeter advancement with a three millimeter impaction. And then I performed a BSSO, counterclockwise rotation. And this was, and then performed the rhinoplasty with rib graft about six months later. This is a patient preoperatively before Lefort BSSO, genoglossal advancement and rhinoplasty with rib cartilage grafting. This is the patient afterwards. This is the amount of projection that I was able to achieve for the patient, but notice, that the maxilla was deficient here, it's projected here. The nose now has a stable base to put the rib cartilage graft on. This is a patient preoperatively, postoperatively, and I can tell you at five years, uh, the patient is still cured of his obstructive sleep apnea and the nose is still projected and stable. 
and he is more importantly decannulated and able to breathe. You can see here the tracheotomy and no longer has a tracheotomy. So there's some challenges and take home messages that I'd like to uh, discuss here. Um, revision rhinoplasty is difficult. Uh, it requires structural support. If you can consider a thoughtful uh, stepwise approach, uh, then I think it's important. Thoughtful planning is important. Where you lack cartilage, utilizing cartilage grafting from the ear, the septum, uh, costal cartilage is important. Secondarily, recognizing both internal and external valve insufficiency is important. If you don't, it requires a multi-level approach um, later on. And so I recommend correcting internal and external valve problems at your primary rhinoplasty in order to avoid secondary deficiencies. And I showed you some techniques in your primary rhinoplasty that you can utilize prior to, uh, prior to closing a cosmetic rhinoplasty. Lastly, uh, balancing aesthetic and functional concerns should not be exclusive, they should be inclusive. So we should be trying to improve the internal valve, improve the external valve uh, in one operation in order to avoid secondary operations. Where ailer retraction is presenting uh, itself, crural reconstruction, utilizing septal extension graft, lateral crural stiffening, replacement grafts, ailer rim grafts should be utilized. And lastly, addressing septal deformities at the time of a Lafort one should be conservative in nature in order to avoid saddle nose deformity. Although I showed you a case of a saddle nose deformity which was native to the patient. You can see how over a section of a septoplasty of a septum at the time of Lafort one would have led to more saddling and I needed to preserve that septum for later nasal reconstruction. This is my contact information. I'm happy to uh, to address any questions and uh, I'm happy to reach out on my AO app uh, with you all after the presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jose, for uh, this uh, fantastic uh, presentation and uh, that uh, these uh, very uh, challenging uh, cases with uh, very informative description and the variety of patients you have uh, shared with us. Uh, and uh, the, the, the wonderful uh, results you can get uh, and achieve uh, achieving uh, giving your patients uh, 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 a cosmetic and functional uh, outcome. Uh, I like the lot the, the concept that you have um, explained uh, about the, the, the biomechanics uh, of the uh, uh, of the nose uh, in, 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 in from this concept as, uh, as you shown in this uh, paper uh, uh, published by yourself of the how much pressure can it holds and uh, going and uh, this application of using uh, a good support uh, using uh, a tonguing groove or uh, a septal extension rather than your uh, as you described rather than uh, a columellar strut uh, and i like this uh, concept a lot and its application uh, also uh, using the suspension the lateral suspension as uh, as you described, um, I think it's it's biomechanically it makes sense when you put uh, it's, you think about the nose as as a tent as it's described, and then uh, you have the solid uh, uh, support uh, in the middle, and then you put the suspension as yes. a, a tent from uh, the sides. Uh, we have some questions here around this um, uh, this subject. Uh, from uh, uh, Khaled, and he was uh, asking about uh, this lateral suspension here. Yes. How how long does it last as as a suturing technique? And uh, we know that sutures uh, they have some um, a question over how long they last. Yes. Uh, and uh, 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 another another point I want also to uh, uh, to ask you and to highlight more on the direction of suspension. So which, which vector do you uh, uh, put your anchor uh, on which point uh, on the anterior wall of the maxilla or on the nasal lateral nasal bone but low, uh, whether you suspend the lower alar cartilage or the upper uh, alar cartilage? Great, great question. So lateral nasal wall suspension technique can be somewhat nuanced, first of all, and it requires some experience and really preoperative evaluation because if the patient has uh, internal valve collapse or an intervalve collapse or 
and external valve collapse. These are different zones. And so addressing that uh, ahead of time, I think it's important. The, the design of the implant, the MyTech Quick Anchor, is that the Quick Anchor is made out of pyrolactic acid. And so that's going to dissolve, but it's going to take six months to a year for that anchor to dissolve. The suture will, will also dissolve, but by the time the patient heals, it'll be, uh, it'll, be it'll be elevated and suspended. Now, I utilize this technique in patients that we don't have cartilage. So it's a good technique where a septoplasty has already been performed. You're doing a revision rhinoplasty case. There's not sufficient cartilage, uh, and uh, may, the ear cartilage may not be sufficient because it's, it's not strong enough, it's too curvilinear. The patient maybe will not be will not opt for rib graft, costal cartilage graft. So then, what are you left with? You have no septum, no ear cartilage. The patient won't do rib. The lateral nasal wall suspension could be a salvage procedure, and that's exactly how I describe it. Um, this is I presented the case of a patient with alabatin grafts with ear cartilage grafting. She already had a septoplasty, and so we utilize that technique as a salvage procedure. And so, what the other part of the question is, where would you suspend? If, if it's a internal valve problem, I will suspend to the upper lateral cartilage alone. If it's a lower external valve problem, I'll suspend to the lateral cura. If it's an intervalve, this zone, the in-between zone, we call the intervalve, I would suspend to both. And that's the video that Dr. Mose showed uh, where the intervalve was suspended. I do utilize this through an open rhinoplasty technique and not through the subciliary technique which Dr. Friedman described because it does rotate the nasal tip and I want to see how much tension I can provide. I can tell you that in my hands, I utilize this technique quite a bit, but I have gone to uh, not utilizing it much more because there's so many other techniques for lateral suspension, for lateral stiffening, um, which, which are very useful. The one technique that I did not describe, which should also be uh, entertained, is a butterfly graft, which is a graft that can also improve the external valve uh, and the intervalve angle. Uh, and I didn't describe it, I didn't utilize this technique, but I know there are many surgeons out there that use it. So there's so many techniques out there, you almost have to select the technique to the appropriate patient. Where there's lack of cartilage, I think the lateral nasal wall suspension may be a useful tool. Yes, and um, one other question I want to uh, ask you about your experience in using um, uh, a turn-in uh, spreader uh, flaps from the uh, uh, upper uh, lateral cartilage. Yeah, no spreader, no, spreader flaps are good. Uh, I think that if you have a high dorsal hump and you have a high septum, you can preserve the upper lateral cartilage, take down the septum, and now you have do you have uh, spreader flaps from the upper lateral cartilage? They can be utilized and folded in, uh, and those are fine techniques. Um, they've, uh, there's some research showing that the nose scores improve with spreader flaps just as well as, as uh, spreader grafts. In my practice, I utilize more spreader grafting because I like, I, a lot of times I see asymmetries in the dorsum, and I like a nice rigid graft to really give me a nice straight, straight nose and so I utilize more spreader grafting, but it's really a, patient, a surgeon's choice. Yeah. And uh, Muhammad, uh, I mean, do you have uh, any questions to uh, Hussein? Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> Jose, um, as we sometimes do rasping uh, the dorsum or even cut it in one block, as you mentioned, your, uh, your you, your uh, favorite uh, technique you do. Sometimes you have, uh, after redu reducing the dorsum, you get some irregularities, yeah. especially in the junction, which is very common to me, especially in the junction between the bony part and the cartilaginous part of the septum, which is the keystone area. And this part, we are always afraid that we, we do over rasping in order yes. to avoid its collapse. So how you can, after, after you do your rasping or your, the hump removal, how you can uh, treat such irregularities, which usually, uh, or sometimes it happens in this area? Yeah, Dr. Amin, I think this is a very critical question. I've changed my technique significantly because of this very issue. It doesn't always happen, but where you have a keystone irregularity, 
uh, and from over uh, rasping, or as was asked by, by Dr. Lopez, where you have a keystone depression from saddling, what do you do there? So either you under rasp <laughs> or you over rasp, or you, know, you, you get a saddle in that area because uh, the septum is not strong enough and the perpendicular plate coming up to the keystone. I've changed my technique whereby, and I just did this just about an hour and a half ago, two hours ago before this presentation. Uh, I've gone to two different techniques. One is in patients with a dorsal hump, a kyphotic hump, I've gone to a preservation rhinoplasty whereby I'm doing a low, low, high osteotomy with a piezo ultrasonic saw and I'm doing a transverse osteotomy and I'm preserving the keystone completely. This is perfect for patients with short nasal bones and thin skin and a kyphotic hump. And so I'll do a letdown procedure for the kyphotic hump is more than four millimeters and I'll do a push down if it's less than four millimeters particularly. Uh, so this technique is, uh, has been described by Dr. Uh, Eve Savan. Dr. Sam Mose published a paper on it recently. We're publishing a video on the American Academy of Facial Plastic and uh, Aesthetic Medicine Journal online of how we perform a preservation rhinoplasty on a patient and then we have a human anatomic model showing our technique. So that's one way to avoid the problem altogether is to preserve the keystone and do a preservation rhinoplasty. However, sometimes you have a small hump and you don't need to do that and, and do such uh, extensive osteotomies. I have gone to using a diamond rasp on a piezo ultrasonic saw whereby I will take off just slowly, gently with a diamond rasp, millimeter by millimeter. As you take off the keystone area, the upper lateral cartilage dives underneath the bone. You will unveil the upper lateral cartilage then, and you will take off this junction, but you will perfectly keep intact the keystone because it is such a gentle approach. And so to me, that is also preservation technique which I call resurfacing of the dorsum. It's a dorsal resurfacing. And so I've gone to these preservation techniques because the keystone is such a critical part. The problem becomes once you over rasp and then you have to do a cartilage graft over it. And then even if you do morselized cartilage graft, sometimes in thin skin, you can see it. Exactly. And then you get into this problem whereby if you go back and re-rasp it, then you get a depression and you're going back and forth with the patient. So it is, I understand, I've been there, I've struggled with this, and so, <laughs> <laughs> and so I've gone to Thank a preservation yeah. approach either through resurfacing or through osteotomies in order to preserve the keystone in this area. Very clear. One, one last thing you could do is don't put the cartilage graft there at all. Uh, yeah. Dr. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a SMAS flap. You can elevate if it's thick skin. Dr. Cabo, Roxana Cabo, describes a SMAS flap, where as you elevate the skin soft tissue envelope, you dissect the SMAS, you preserve the soft tissue SMAS flap, you use that to cover irregularities. And you could, and I've done it where it's actually, I make a lateral based, where I keep these, I cut the midline, but I leave a lateral based SMAS flap that I could drape over the irregularity. So now you can't feel it because actually a muscle apneurotic fat flap that I overdrape. And then the last technique is temporalis fascia to cover it. So you can do temporalis fascia to cover it. So you may have tried that, but, um, but then you know, it may not stay and may resorb. So I like the SMAS flap because it's a vascularized, vascularized uh, flap that you can also utilize in case you end up with that situation. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome, yeah. Philip, uh... Khaled Ghazal, do you have any questions also? Yes, much, much appreciated this uh, comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, 
uh, if you, they let the, 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 the thing for me, I will keep asking to you all the night. And I know I have a long list of operations still uh, you have to do with. Um, uh, my question is, um, I saw you operating for the fifth time in the same patient. And this is a very brief thing. I, I couldn't uh, do it in my <laughs> practice. Sorry. And do you have any concern about the vascularity? Because you, you, you are not the surgeon in the first uh, surgical sessions. So uh, how can you ensure the vascularity? You, you don't know. So, so it's very difficult. And the vascularity that you're speaking of, I assume, is the vascularity of the skin soft tissue envelope. And it is true. If you, with going in for the fifth time, the subdermal plexus has been violated four other times. And when the subdermal plexus is violated, the vascularity is suspect. And so this is a problem. And I thank God there was no problem when I did this case with the vascularity. But I tell the patients that the nose will be red for quite some time. They can, they can press on the nose and you can see blanching for quite some time. And if you notice in this patient, she was slightly red in the nasal tip, even though she was three years out, it wasn't too bad, but it's because of loss of subdermal plexus. Recently, there have been papers describing using nanofat as a um, intervening injection after your rhinoplasty in order to try to thicken the skin soft tissue envelope to provide almost like a, a little scar covering. And so, that's, that's something that I think can be deployed. Um, Dr. Torumi has an article on that. Uh, the other thing you can do is use fascia, temporalis fascia, also for the idea of trying to thicken the skin soft tissue envelope. I've never lost, uh, never had skin necrosis mm -hmm. from a revision rhinoplasty, but it is a consideration. And uh, the last thing is that I think that these patients sometimes are also suspect to infection. And the reason why I say that is because, again, the lymphatics has been compromised as well as the subdermal plexus. And so drainage may not be very good. You can have an increased risk for polybeak deformity afterwards. That's why structural grafting is so important. Thank you. And uh, doing good rhinoplasty, you are a good surgeon, but uh, doing revisions, you are a great surgeon. Uh, no, uh, thank you for thank sharing you. your experience. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Welcome. Welcome. So, uh, Manjanath, uh, do you have any uh, question? Yeah, one short question. It was an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, you are mentioning about the ostatomy, about the lipot one, and in one case, the BSSO. Yeah. Uh, this is a common uh, question which comes across, whether do you do at the same time the action of the nose, or you take some time, or what is the time interval you give to such cases? That's a great question. If I'm doing such a large advancement for obstructive sleep apnea cases or significant craniofacial deformity, uh, and the septum is significantly buckled, I do do a septoplasty at the same time as the Lafort down fracture. And I think that's important because otherwise you will get over projection, over rotation of the nasal tip. But I will do a base up reduction um, okay. of the septum. I don't take off caudal septum. I don't remove posterior septum. If I remove keystone, then the patient surely will saddle. For sure, they will saddle. Now, there are surgeons in Brazil that will do a simultaneous uh, Lafort 1 and rhinoplasty. And uh, a good friend of mine uh, down in Brasilia um, uh, will, will do this, and I think they get really good results. And what they'll do is they'll do a combined approach They'll have two surgeons. The problem with doing a rhinoplasty with a Lafort and a bilateral sagittal split is now you have an eight-hour operation, right? And an eight-hour operation is difficult on anyone, let alone somebody with severe obstructive sleep apnea. And so we want to minimize swelling. We want to minimize third spacing of, of, of fluid. And so I think that doing a secondary rhinoplasty, let everything settle down is fine. Uh, is a better approach. But I will do a, a, a base upper section of the septum and release the buckling that is apparent after the fort one. But the, the time period is how long do you keep oh, it? Six as? months. After the fort one, I'll go in and do a rhinoplasty. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I didn't show you a case, but I did a case in Rwanda. Uh, by, she had a um, cleft lip palate deformity, 
uh, and uh, no treatment at all. I did a two-piece Lafort. Uh, I bone grafted the piriform aperture, and I also put Medpor, porous polyethylene. And uh, we came back six months later, and one of my friends, Kofi Boheni, uh, who I operate with uh, when we go to Rwanda, uh, he came in and did the rhinoplasty six months later after the Lafort, and beautiful results. Even though we did a two-piece Lafort, right? And you would think, wow, with a two-piece Lafort, an advancement uh, with bone grafting, you would think that you couldn't do a rhinoplasty in six months, but she was able to get a beautiful result after six months with, with two-piece Lafort, advancement, and bone grafting. There was enough of a base there that you can do the rhinoplasty. And uh, Amr, uh, do you have any questions for uh, Jose? Um, I'd just like to thank him very much for the great presentation. And um, well, Mini, I wanted to uh, discuss a little bit about uh, would, how often do you get an association in obstructive sleep apnea with uh, like an external valve or an internal valve defect? I think uh, Dr. Manjanath was also targeting that point. Yes. Um, I mean, I know that you come from Stanford and you, uh, Stanford invented the, the, the treatment of OSA in a, like a mm -hmm. classification manner. Yes. So how often is there an association with either an external valve or an internal valve defect? And if it's there, is it like you diagnose it and then you do the orthognathic surgery and then you come back and do the nose or, or would you go spontaneous? Um, and then thank you very much for breaking down uh, the, um, the problems that, that affect the nose. Like I, I really liked it, how you broke it down into like lateral wall, internal valve, external valve, what we do for the septum. So thank you for the great presentation. Great, thank you, thank you, appreciate it. I, it's, it's a very important question because uh, sleep ap I, I see sleep apnea patients commonly. We have a sleep surgery practice. I have, we have two sleep surgeons. We have two facial plastic surgeons. We have a body plastic surgeons. We do maxillofacial, so we see these patients quite often. And uh, the, it's very important to find out what the goal of the patient is. If the goal of the patient is to be on continuous positive airway pressure CPAP, which replace every single patient with sleep apnea, moderate, severe sleep apnea. And if that's their end goal, then we will fix the nose, internal valve, external valve, septum, do the whole thing at once in order to optimize CPAP pressures. And there are studies by Thayer, by Friedman et al., which demonstrate that if you improve the nasal uh, deviated septum turbinate, the nasal obstruction, that you will see a two point to four point drop in the CPAP pressure. And that's enough for patients to continue on CPAP and not need further surgery and be fine. But if the goal is to try to go for success, which is dropping the AHI by half and less than 20, or cure, which is dropping the AHI less than five, then I will delay nasal reconstruction till after we're completely done with our phased approach. And our phased approach may include palate surgery, tongue-based surgery, you know, a glossectomy reduction may include a genoglossal advancement. We do inspire hypoglossal nerve stimulation in our practice, and, and, it may, and we consider all that phase one. And then phase two, which is similar to the Stanford protocol, would be our maximum mandibular advancement. So we have patients that are trach dependent, patients that are very severe, AHI is over 80, people who are very heavy, BMI is over 40, and we offer them these approaches. If the patient wants to, cannot tolerate CPAP, then we'll go through a phase one, phase two approach, then we'll do the nose last. But if the patient can tolerate CPAP, we'll do the nose first. Now there are some patients which are mild to moderate, in which case mild to moderate, mild obstructive sleep apnea can improve with nasal surgery. So maybe we might do nasal surgery for mild sleep apnea. Once you get to severe, we're delaying nasal surgery because we have to do these other approaches, unless the patient elects to do CPAP. Now, if the patient wants to do an oral appliance and the oral appliance has some success, which is a mandibular repositioning device, uh, then uh, we will do the nose so the patient can breathe while the mandibular repositioning device is advanced. So it's very nuanced when and how we, we, we do these operations, but, but we try to see how the patient does on positive airway pressure first before we make a decision which route we're gonna take. Lastly, I'm doing a procedure called a distraction osteogenesis with maxillary expansion, a dome procedure, 
also uh, invented at Stanford in the last three years. It is a procedure that Stanley Liu and Bob Riley have, uh, have popularized recently. There's some literature on it. It is essentially a two-piece Lefort one, whereby we are not advancing. We're making a midline cut with a piezo. We're splitting two with eight and nine. We're then doing a anterior maxillary cut, but no pterygoid cuts. And then we're putting a maxillary expander in at the same time, and then we're, ex we're distracting tooth eight and nine. What this does for us is it increases the nasal width, and by increasing the nasal width, you improve the nasal airflow. And in recent studies in the last two years, we see an improvement for moderate sleep apnea. It's not an operation for severe sleep apnea, but it is an operation for people with moderate sleep apnea. It's also an operation for people with a transverse deficiency and crossbite, where you want to expand, but you don't need to advance. So then you can expand and then orthodontically get the occlusion where you need it. It's a surgically, uh, surgically assisted maxillary expansion, basically. It's very similar to a SARP, right? Yeah. It's very similar, but we're doing a two-piece Lefort and mm -hmm. we're only doing the anterior cuts and then we're putting the expander in at the same time and we're drilling the expander into the palate. So it's very similar to the, to, to the SARPI, um, but it's done to maximize the nasal width. So almost like when you, we do a, a Lefort 1 sagittal split, we do it for orthognathic reasons. But when we do it for sleep surgery, right, for sleep apnea, the, 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 it's similar cuts, but bigger movements. Same thing with the dome. Bigger movements than a SARPI because you're correcting a larger transverse deficiency. So you have the tools. You know how to do this. It's just the, it's just the application of how much you want to expand. And it's also maybe a different patient population. It may help you for nasal airway for patients that maybe have failed external valve, internal valve, septoplasty. They're still constricted. They have a tiny, narrow nasal width because they have a transverse deficiency of the maxilla. That's why it's so beautiful to have a conference with oral surgeons, plastic surgeons, otolaryngologists, because we're, we're all doing operations in the same space and they're all complementary. And um, we can, uh, uh, and, uh, I think we still have uh, Carlos with us and he, he had just, uh, he asked you a question before on the chat. So if you want to uh, elaborate on his question, uh, if, 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 you, if you would like to discuss it with you, Carlos? Yes. I know that I'm he asked a sure question about the Keystone <laughs> Junction disarticulation. Oh. Yeah. So he's now, he's, now he's uh, he, I can, he's not, yes? 